Hello and welcome back to, I guess, another Play Basic blog, the first one for 20, 2021, I guess. Yeah, crazy. So a bit of a bit of filling, really, uh, over the summer. It's summer for us, of course, here in Australia. Although you wouldn't tell by the weather outside, it's been terrible. Um, so over the Christmas break, over the New Year's break, uh, that's been pretty busy for me. So I haven't done much with computers at all, pretty much. Watched a few bits and pieces here, been inspired by some things, um, done a bit of coding here or there, and made the now traditional New Year's Eve video that I make pretty much every year these days. Uh, someone, someone wrote the particle code years ago. I went, oh, that's pretty good. I'll just use that and I'll, I'll jazz it up a bit. So I'll jazz it up a bit. The video itself is all composite with, with PV. The particle animation is done with Play Basic. Uh, someone else wrote, wrote the original code for that and I just updated it at some point. Because it was just there and I wanted to do it quickly. I think a few years ago for New Year's Eve. I'm not quite sure when that was. So I made that first New Year's Eve video. Uh, so I've made three or four of them in a row now. Uh, each one's a little bit more complicated than the previous year, to make it a bit more interesting. Uh, I'll play this for you now, actually, if you haven't seen it. So let's turn the volume down. You get the gist it's just the park animation with some crossfaded photos i took around our city uh, in the background pretty much I've, I've made all of it except the the champagne glass um, image and the opening 2020 image and even did the singing so there you go <clears throat> that's my attempt at doing some some gravelly voice type stuff but yeah the last stock Images from uh, from Pexels there as well. This is the kind of thing we do every year, just for a bit of fun, you know. Uh, the code for this is on the forum uh, down here, and this makes the animation. Uh, it does actually. You know, I'm not locked in, so I can't grab the, the full source code. Uh, if you log in, you can grab the full source code and have a look at the whole thing. Uh, by default, it's set to save out the frames while it's rendering it. So it's there's a bit of slowdown doing that stuff. Uh, but, you know, it's a bit of fun. On to more important things. Uh, other bits of code that were released lately. What else we got with the... The Seek and Destroy mock-up. Um just kind of an idea based on something that Dam is doing. I can't remember what it was now. Oh, transplant, that's right. I wasn't familiar with this game at all, actually. I know, I, you know, I've been an Amiga owner for a long time, but I'd never seen this game. It might have come out probably when I was sort of getting out of Amigas. It's pretty cool. Um, so he's left the source code here for you to mess around with. Uh, just log in, grab it, and have a play with it. And the game looks a bit like this. We'll turn the volume down. Skip forward. This is the Amiga version, of course, being displayed. Uh, his version, I think, has... I think it has the, the player, the star field, the bullets. I think maybe the ships, even. Don't quote me on that, but I'm not sure what it is. Pretty cool. But I thought we well, could just do the same thing. You know, with rotating the play field. Um, no, it's too long, that one. When you're logged out of the board, it doesn't, uh, doesn't allow really long bits of code snippets to be on the board. Um, chokes up the, the phrasing too much, and we wanted people to log in and, and actually download the associated files and you know talk back with other people etc right uh, so in, to, in code to organ oh, watch the video there I guess 
I've used the standard, um, is it the ship or the ball? I'm not sure now. There's two, two bits of artwork that have been in pretty much every, <laughs> every PV demo for, for, oh, there you go, the ship and the ball uh, for almost 20 years. Pretty close shown. So we've got a, a two lead play field rotate of sprites and the sprites can have their own orientation as well. You could do zooming and that kind of stuff as well by just projecting the points. When you hit space, it randomizes the, the scene. So initially it starts out with a, the sprites in like a, uh, a rectangle layout. These are just chucked everywhere. It just rotates the whole scene. So if there's you know 5,000 sprites, it just rotates 5,000 sprites. Bit of fun. Uh, the game I thought he was talking about, just going back to Dan's example of Transplant, was uh, was Seek and Destroy on the Amiga. That one I remember. Uh, it was written by the guys over in New Zealand. I think that's written by Acid or the other one. Uh, it wasn't written by Mark Sibley. It was because there was Mark Sibley and a bunch of these other groups that were doing, working with the same sort of. They were kind of friends. They all knew each other, and uh, we knew some of those people as well. I met Mark originally when he was at uh, Digisoft here in, in Geelong. That would be 25 years ago. Yeah, yeah probably. Crazy, man. So a lot of those people kind of knew each other in the Australian scene anyway. Not doing much blogging, are we? So a bit of a catch up with some uh, code that's been released. Uh, we've got some other bits and pieces there. Some updates of things, I guess. Perimeter bucket. I think they're all sort of older ones now. They're October, July-ish. If you've got a bit of, bit of code you want to share, join, jump on the forum and just start a thread in here and just share it with other people. You know, it's a, it helps it helps you get feedback and it helps other people learn by what you're doing rather than just me dictating some stuff onto the board. I kind of, I kind of get bored of just my own crap. It's terrible. Transplant mock-up, back to here. So, over the Christmas break, um, I had one project I was going to, I was keen to have a look at, and I'm not sure I should say this out loud or not. Uh, here's animation. It was actually to do with Steve's engine. I think that that one there. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, Steve Steve wrote a a software renderer that does perspective correct texture mapping. Uh, has clipping. It's pretty much it's ready to go. And I, I always wanted to get around to building a version of it that was um, could be passed through PB to DLL. Just really demonstrate to people that you can do some pretty serious stuff with this if you wanted to, if if you can work out a way to lay your structure your your application. I was just trying to find Steve's example. Um, I'm building basic 3D engine. That's Steve's thread. Since we're not logged in, it doesn't show you the member names, that kind of stuff. You can't download the attachments directly without being logged in. So as, as per usual, there's a bit of conversation about going on, but hey, you know, here's some ideas, try them out. Um, where are we? This is a very early version of it. I think you must have seen, if you looked at the Facebook pages or those kind of things, I'll skip to the, the last part of the thread. That's the, that's the example there. Uh, I think I've got a video of me playing through this or something like that. Um, and for the record, I've still never managed to get... You can jump as well, so there's basic physics and sliding collision as well. So it's got a lot of stuff in it, if you want to check it out. Uh, you've, got to, you've got to walk the camera over here, jump up to here, and jump across. And I've got all the way across to here, onto this level here, and, and fallen. Um, so I'm not quite sure what happens when you get to the, the end marker. That'd be a mystery for another day, I guess. Uh, so I guess that's the 
Nothing but snow. That's probably the, the video I made of the pictures in the thread, it might have been. Made a video gallery of this fantastic progress, okay. It's my tw oh, sorry, yeah. Uh, so different computers and different drivers react different to things like locked buffers. So you might have on your system a locked buffer might not be that much of a problem. But for another computer on another driver, you might not you might really dislike that, that buffer locking. So in here there was a, some bogus buffer locking where it, it was just legacy code. I mean, he'd written the, the rendering routines a bunch of times and as you do over time, you, leave, you comment things out and leave things in that you don't really need to be there. Uh, let's try and find where it's actually running. There it is. Don't want it set to 480p. Pump it up there a little bit, thanks. Hmm. Hmm. So this is all software rendering. This is not hardware accelerated at all. Everything he's saying is just written in PV. So he's done the physics, the rendering, collision, uh, effectively Z buffering. Actually, I don't think it's Z buffer. I think it's got a, a triangle sort. Um, you probably could do some kind of spatial things to eliminate some of the, the polygon sort of popping you get occasionally. Like over here, there's there's a shared surface there. So the two boxes, are, one's bound to sort in front of the other at, at some point. And with a per pixel Z buffer, uh, that's not really a problem, even though you're rendering two surfaces over top of each other. So in, if you have a per pixel Z buffer, you're meant to render from front to back rather than back to front. So near polygons, large polygons get drawn first and other smaller ones get clipped behind that one there because the cost of a, a, a Z comparison is much cheaper than actually uh, doing, a, doing a, a, a whole uh, perspective correct pixel and then only for it to be uh, drawn over at some other later point. So this one doesn't have Z buffering, but it has polygonal Z buffering. So it sorts the whole scene. Um, I think it's just a giant um, buffer of, of polygons that are spit out after transformation and clipping. Don't quote me on that. I've looked at the source code for a while, but I did look at the source code the other day. This is the whole point of this little uh, thing with jig. I thought, well, I mentioned to him that you could do a BB to DLL version of this, and I haven't done this, don't get excited, I haven't done this. But because I sat down, looked at the code, and went, oh jeez, there's a lot more of this than what I was bargaining for. Uh, hmm. But my idea over there, between Christmas and New Year's news, I was going to uh, build a version of this that was effectively like a library um, and an example. So you would split all of the rendering code away from the project. At the moment, the whole thing's all all one thing. It's all fine. Did I write that, did I? Oh, it's an interval, that's right. I'm using the, um, the start interval to, to compute how long something takes in not just in milliseconds, that it's a whatever high resolution timer is set to. Um, what, was it, what was it talking about? So the idea was to was to get this thing, uh, get the, all of the really the low level work stuff done, separ separate it out into a separate include of all of the functionality. That include has to compile by itself. Once it does that. And you don't need to have direct access between like things like vertex data for example uh, if you have some functions that let you create an object create a, you know a shape whether it's a cube or a sphere or something or load a mesh from somewhere else and that's hidden away on inside the engine the user just creates a cube renders the cube or renders the scene you know sets the orientation of the cube you know uh, it's it, at this location in space, I want it to be this scale and I want it to have this texture applied to it. 
Uh, but when I looked through the code, I was like, oh, geez, it's not quite at that point, really. Um, like, it's cooler. I think really here, what we pro what I would probably do is I wouldn't use array passing for objects. I think, I can't actually remember how it's set up now. Probably should check that out better before talking about how it works. See, here's our internal complexity, right? So we've got, we're pulling the keys, we're moving objects, we're doing collisions, I assume, there. There's a translation, getting everything ready. So now all of this stuff here doesn't really need to be in the user's hands. It can be pushed out to a third party. So my, my point is, is that uh, at the moment, this is a, it's a fancy example. It's a fantastic bit of coding, but it's not really that friendly for people to use. So you, we have to separate the the internal logic uh, out and simplify it, make a little set of, set of functions, you know. So I was hoping there would be a set of functions in here that kind of do that already, but they don't really work the way I was intended, uh, was, was hoping, yeah. But we could build something out of it. But this is gonna be my, you know, uh, my fun project over the over the, a week of between Christmas and New Year's pretty much and that was going to be my gift to the, to the community but it didn't get done what a surprise rather I spent that time you know uh, having a fantastic uh, time with uh, aged care if, if you ever have to deal with aged care then you probably know what I'm talking about then it's not fantastic all right, so this didn't, didn't get done. Uh, the other thing I was working on before and still been messing around with is the math library. Showcase, there it is there. Uh, so this hasn't been updated pretty much since the 20th of December. So we're, we're about ready for another update of this. Uh, in this build here, I think we've just added the Vector 2 and Vector 3 support. So we've got some very pedestrian sort of vector, vector support. Uh, if, you really, if you really want, if you're really keen on Vector Math, and I haven't done a lot of Vector Math in a, lot of, in a long time. Uh, for, for what functions you want, uh, be very specific, you know, and, and make a post with a list of them down below. Things that you need to do, you know, push this kind of math stuff out of here. Eventually, what I'll probably end up doing is I'll end up pulling this basic math into the runtime as the, a vector library. But we, but we need to know what kind of functions we need before we just go jumping, shoving this stuff into it. I don't want to do it now because I've got this other, for, for like the internals of PB, they have to have the command sets separate. But for this this math library here, I have done some more work on it, um, mostly about setting it up as a library. So pulling the, this source code here apart and uh, do I have that in here? You would think so. Oh, that's right. So I was going to try something a bit different. Um, I thought, well, some people don't like having scripts external, right? I thought, what if you just have your script built into a source tab of PB, right? And then when the application runs, in this case, it would grab this particular source file, run through it, and drag out what's what's between the tags and then phrase that as script so you have your scripts kind of embedded in your project and when it runs it would take the scripts out cut and cut them cut them out to a text file you have to be careful about overwriting things so if you modified the file that was dumped out of the source and then 
ran the thing again, it would it would replace your existing one. Uh, but this is not implemented in this actually, no. And you know, cleaning up all this stuff here, getting all this stuff to be a proper library, or you know, as library. Um, so what will happen is there will be probably some high level commands for dealing with scripts. You'll, you know, you you'll have like a thing for loading a script and you know, a thing for running a script and you know, a thing for querying stuff about the script. So you, could, you can either call the high level interface to do that stuff or the low level stuff. These things here are the low level functions. The actual compile function, the read variable stuff, that's the low level you know, interface that, that you would you know, use. So this, is, this needs a bit of work to get into a form that's easy for people to use and I, I use that word very tentatively. You know, calling something easy never seems to work really, you know. Because people have different ideas of what complexity is all about. Um, but I like the idea of just having a, a tab with your script code in it in, tucked away inside in your in your application and then you know, maybe we have rather than just having script there we could actually have uh, you know math 64 script or something like that you know and then maybe uh, a name or something like that you know equals oh, this is the vector example or something like that so you can store a bunch of these scripts in the same uh, the same file they would have to be stored inside comments as you can see here, I put a comment around the whole thing. And the reason for that is if, if you don't do that, PB will see the code and try and compile it. Of course, it has no idea what this stuff means. So it will just fail. This is a technique I've used in a lot of languages over the years, you know, storing things inside things, often with settings or pre-processing um, of bits of code. Where I know I want something to be replaced, and I'll use a, a, a little tool that I've written uh, to do a processing to run through that source code and just insert these things wherever I want them to be inserted. Uh, a good example is sometimes you, you might want to do things like macros. You might have a, a function that's very simple. You know, it might, it's great for readability. Let's say you've got a function. You know, add integers. <coughs> A and B, end function, result, A plus B, now, now I, re I realise that's a, a ridic ridiculous bit of code to write, but you might, you might have this thing, you know, up here, mm. okay. oh yeah, this is, this is much easier for me to, to do something, this might be a you know, a simple bit of logic or a complicated bit of logic, who knows. What I would do is if I knew this function here is never going to change, if it does a very specific thing, I would make it go through uh, and do a replace, would find these, these function calls in the code, would find the function and rip it. And then find the, find the function here and do substitute the logic with these parameters so often what you have to do is you've got to do stuff like this you've got to cut this out put brackets around here since i know this is being added together because the person might might put um might have had an expression on with both terms you never know what that does though is it, is it makes this cuts this function call out and it solves this thing whatever you want this thing to be at that location if we're talking about convenience, which is what we're, we are talking about, you know, this is convenient, but slower than having a bit of code that does this. And in PV land, this will be solved at runtime. Sorry, at compile time. So the output code would simply be print 300. If I could spell print, isn't that, isn't that crazy? Right. So many sidetracks, 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 aren't we? Uh, but getting back to what, what we're talking about, you know, the things that I'm looking forward to doing in the coming weeks, really, 
is getting the, my office back into a usable state. At the moment, it's not. And uh, getting the math library into a usable state that people can kind of find their way around, you know. Um, I don't know if it's going to be fantastically something that people will use or if they won't use it, you know. That's okay, fair enough. It was a, a bit of a, um, a thrown out there concept at the, at the best of times. But for me, I, I do have sort of a usage of it. I can see some other other projects that would come from this too. We could have like a, a, a we could split apart the Lexa and have a Lexa, a library that does Lexing. So you could have it break up code into kind of PB elements. Uh, that helped for doing secondary things for people with doing like scripting, as I was saying before, doing replacements of things. So you wouldn't have to do all, all that whack work yourself. You can just pull in the Lexa library, give it a source code, and it gives you a representation of that source code. And you just skim through it and go, okay, all I want to find is these certain keywords and then react to those keywords and then just spit the tokens back out. Sounds easy, doesn't it? Sounds simple. And it isn't that difficult, to be honest. So that could be another a little library off the side of this thing. Uh, off the main problem here, the main conversation we've been having for a long time is that, you know, these internal command sets, like all of the command sets in here, so, you know, print, for example. Uh, these are built in, they're separated from the runtime but the command sets are built into a big blob of this, uh, this this code that does this particular behavior here. So print is doing, is rendering this text onto the screen where the location is. Now, we have to separate this stuff from it. And when we do that, uh, we can potentially replace command sets and, and have uh, commands have parts of the language that could be included or excluded based on what you what you wish pretty much i think i've come up with a way of doing it well i've had a way in mind for a while actually like the way internal command sets work now is i've got a, there's a, a big table pretty much to what the command name is what the parameter requirements are some other bits and pieces of information about the about this function and that when the compiler sees that thing, it looks through the command table and goes, oh yeah, sees a, a token in the command table, it looks for the token, it checks the parameters and goes, okay, you're this thing, I'm gonna spit you out to the bytecode. In the, in the future, that it will still do this, the same thing, but we won't have command sets built into the compiler, they'll be included, so you'll have, I don't know what, the, what this will look like at the moment, but let's say it's, you know, include, you know, command set or something. Let's just say we have a thing called include command set, a directive it would be. These have to be the first, be included before the commands you're, you're about to use are seen. And command sets can have internal dependencies as well. So let's say if this was, you know, um, screen or something like that. That's the screen driver. Then you've got a, a text driver for things like hello world. So the screen is the, the actual display, the window handling stuff that goes into the display. So you can get things like input from the, the, the thing display. Uh, I guess you could have like require there actually. You know what I mean? You could. You could probably reads better if, if it's require rather than just include. But inside this little, this keyword here is another definition, a, a bit of text pretty much, that has a list of what, uh, where this DLL of the command sets exists, um, a list of the available command names that we type in, and then a mapping of those command names to what they, they'll be called in the DLLs. Now, in some places we would, have to, we would need multiple versions of, of a command 
to do to match up with what PV how PV works. Uh, I think we could probably do some get rid of some of that in the future actually. Um, what I mean is, is the internal the casting rules that PV uses. So you can actually a lot of internal functions are they're explicitly typed internally, but you can pass them uh, any integer you want, whether it's an integer or a floating point. It, it, it'll convert them for you. I like that personally, but some people don't. Uh, things like internal command sets, you have to be pretty strict on that. You don't want it doing conversion of things on your behalf. You want this thing to just drop that thing in and it works exactly the way it's uh, embedded. So this, whatever the screen, whatever this is here, would be defined inside PV somewhere. I like the, um, the standard libraries of uh, your include files, actually. So things like um, over here, for example, uh, Right, so these libraries here are documentation. These, these ones here are effectively supported libraries. Um, there are other libraries that come with PV that are not supported at all. Uh, some are really old, some are just mess around things, some were trialing ideas, etc. Like the frame share animation, for example. Some information here. But when we have, when we insert when we want to use these functions, we include frame sheet atoms at the top of our program, and it's just a bunch of functions. That's all it is. You can check the stuff out up here if you want. Start a new project. So if I want to use, if I want to use frame sheet animations, I just include that. Put a sync and a wait, just so it does nothing. Does nothing. Back to here. But if you want to, wondering what functions are in these things, you can go here to open file cursor and open up the source code. That's the source code for the for the library. So in the documentation, it talks about these main function names. So a lot of them in this particular library. Delete frame sheet, load frame sheet. So pulling, you know, pulling the frame sheet into memory, and it cuts it up for you, or does whatever it's required of it. And then we make animations from those frame sheets. And animus is uh, just playing back those sequence of frames. Um, one after the other, pretty much, at a particular rate. But you can look at the code inside this thing now. Going back to our command set conversation, these would be much the same things. It would probably have a definition of a bit of PB code that is being included in your, in your program at the top of the program that has definitions of the commands of this uh, grouping. So in this case, it would be screen commands. So things like open screen would be a function within this bit of code. Mm. At the moment, this open screen is tied inside the compiler. Uh, so the open screen document might be like this. I, I don't know how, how it would be at the moment. But it could just be a bunch of um, linked DLL statements. Yeah, the you know, screen screen DLL, let's say it's called that. And then a bunch of these uh, calls in the bottom there. So open screen might be what are the what's the normal parameters for open screen? Not the width, uh, oops. These are just definitions of the prototype, pretty much width, height, is it depth and then mode. We have an alias. This is what the function is really called inside inside the DLL. It might be called, you know, you know, GL screen open or something. 
and if there's a return, uh, we have like a return integer, so if it returns something. So in this screen bit of code, it would, the, co the internal code for this library would look like this, and then probably some setup code as well. Probably it would probably call some of these functions before it ever gets to your program. In the case of PB, the classic open screen opens up. I think it's a 32. You know, because this is being included and embedded above your code, it would, it would have the same behavior. So you would, you would run your code and a screen mode would be uh, included, it would be set up for you, and you could just do print or whatever on, uh, out there for you. But I need time to cut, and cut this crap out pretty much. Yeah. As I said before, I've, I've got that, I've got a few theories about how to do that and make it fit within PB. Um, that would be quite nice. Yeah. Uh, for this stuff here, if, you, if you're using Leap DLL, by the way, you can actually put a, I think of the key symbols, like an asterisk or something like that, and it will load this DLL into, it will copy it to memory, and then execute that from memory, which means that when you build an executable out of your, your final executable out of, out of your PB app, it will copy this into the executable, and you don't need it on disk. So you don't need a bunch of binary files in a secondary folder called binary or something like that. Um, if you're worried about those kind of things. And, and if we have this set up here, we can swap screen DLLs. You know, you, we, have a, we have different types of screens and then anything that's written to call the internal functions for a screen here, like this text, this text here, command set, for example, it would have a requirement to know what the what the internal screen is. And there might be these might be public functions, public things that we see. But there might also be a whole bunch of these internal uh, functions below this, which would be you know private. Which other command sets might might um, be be calling? So there might be with with screen in particular. The actual compositing, the rendering, is would be taken place by the device. If we want this to be as transparent or, or as, as separated as possible, then there needs to be a function in, in here, you know, um, you know private uh, draw text or something like that, the string. screen private print or something so the actual text function here is making a call to the screen function if it exists to do this thing in this case here we probably have things like print and text would be part of the screen initially so standard primitives would be all part of that screw thing as well so you, once you include them you've got them there course there's issues then with things like if we have text so we what kind of fonts are we dealing with are we dealing with just classic bitmap fonts or are we dealing with sort of true type fonts or uh, you know polygonal type fonts as well a bunch of things get opened up you know by trying to make it more open we can try to try to hang ourselves in some cases but I just like the idea of having the, the command set split away from the, the runtime we can have a different set of command sets included in your project and they might not be they might not have all the same functionality you might just have like a, a screen mode or and some basic sprite functions or whatever but you can get your application running on something else yeah just kind of same but when, once we get the office set up we'll hope I can get the office set up anyway uh, that this is what this is all about I think, I think this year's been probably the, the leanest year uh, ever for releases. I, I don't know how many things, how many issues, well, sorry, how many builds were released this year, but it wouldn't be many. Um, I 
Got a showcase, for example. Uh, the work in progress is here, so we'll have a look at what we've. Right, so beta C2 beta 15 was put up uh, in July. A couple of that's what types on lists. Okay, so a few things were updated in July, which is good. Undim restored and build 16. I'm not sure if that was uploaded. It may not have been uploaded. Oh, that's terrible. So we've got a couple of revisions to, to this, but not many revisions. That's 2018. Yeah, that's crazy. 2018. This is 2018. 2019. May 2020. So March was probably the first one there. March. No, no, March 2020. No, that's, that's, that's the previous year, sorry. So May, yeah. So I think there's probably only about three updates released to the uh, primary runtime this year for 165, which is, oh, in 20 years, that's, that's nothing really. We used to do updates and builds, you know, every few weeks. It drove some people mental. <laughs> it, it really did. It drove... Like, oh god, it's all it always feels like it's in a state of flux. Well Right, so through May May to June, July there's a bunch of updates done on it. Um you're broken in to the index that's I know there's some there's some annoying problems with um, with Windows ten in particular. With one six five generation. I can't think of what they are now, but um, I had some problems with timing on my system there for a while. I think it's a bit of a thing with uh, with the timer commands in Windows 10 uh, and Windows 8 too. I don't it doesn't seem to work very well on Windows 8. Uh, I've had some theories about what you could do to improve that timing stuff, but uh, they're just theories. Hmm. Yeah, so not much, not many updates last year, unfortunately. Uh, if you look back through some other ones, you'll you'll find there are. Oh gee, there's another one there. Can I go to the start of this thread? This is this is the one six five uh, development thread. The way these things work, by the way, if you, in case you're not familiar with this process, when we start a new build, in case you're not familiar. What I'd like to do is I like to have, have a blog have all of the updates in one thread, right? Now, if you've ever been on uh, other programming forums and you end up with threads that have, they're not cross-referenced, you, you can't find the information about this, what was added to this update. So I like to try and put as much of this stuff in the one place as possible. There's probably some bits and pieces that don't have that stuff, you know, so shoot me. But here you can see, this is retail history. These are all the revisions of 164. So you can go read those ones there if you want to. Same thing, got a bunch of, uh, these are the, the release builds of that generation. So there's four of these release builds. That span two years, unbelievable. And it covers all kinds of things. Um, whatever sort of green ones were, were in the background that we're working on at the time. 2016. Mm. Oh, for 164, that was partnering with the, the PB to DLL project, so they had to match up perfectly. That's what we don't want to have in the future. We, we want to have this thing, have a tool that does the conversion to machine code or conversion to C or whatever the hell you want, and then not have to be tied to a particular version of the command set. <sighs> yeah. Otherwise, you would have to have every PB command in your target, and that's unreal sick. A lot, of, a lot of command sets people don't use. So, wow, ramble on today, eh? Yeah. So th these, uh, getting back to this, this, this thread here, these threads are work in progress threads. They have their diary of changes made to this particular bill. 
Um, so here I've even set myself a mission statement, uh, runtime update objectives, faster, smaller and static. Faster, further bridge the gap between native machine code and bytecode execution uh, through runtime. Smaller, separate command sets from runtime instruction sets. So runtime is independent of command set implementations. Static uh, instruction set uh, to make translations easier. Yeah. Old versions didn't have this. And this is it was a, a nice thing uh, back in the day, but it's absolutely frustrating to go forward. You need this stuff to be static to build secondary tools that can rely on the instruction set and, and do uh, do conversions for you. Um, ideally have third parties write tools that do conversions. That would be my dream, you know. Which is a pretty pathetic dream when you think about it. But, you know. Alrighty, so... That's, that's how the blogs there work, by the way. Uh, for PB itself, I want to get this other, this math library to a point where it's kind of uh, more than a novelty for people. They can have mess around with it and try and do something with it. And if you find a, a situation where you, you need certain functionality, then head across here. I think this thread's in the showcase, as per usual, to the, the blog here and... Um, you know, voice your opinion. And if you have, getting back to this, if you have ideas for there should be a Mat64, you should be posting them down the bottom here. Write, write a bit of an idea and chuck it at the bottom and just leave the code there and if, and I'll just implement it into, into the library directly. See how much that, that accelerates your examples. If you need certain functions, certain uh, uh, beyond what's already, already supported, which is almost not, not much at all really, I think there's a few functions there, like grab a normal, grab a length of something, uh, grab a dot product and grab a cross product. That's about all that's in it from memory. If you need stuff outside of that, jump on the forum and tell us. Uh, getting way too late now, so I better go. Uh, thanks for hanging around. Have a, hope you have a, a great 2021. Hope it doesn't suck like 2020 did. Uh, and I'll see you on the forums and uh, Enjoy your coding, enjoy your, your retro fix of play, play basic.